Hello and welcome to yet another episode of Dr. Sin. Today we'll be discussing about organ transplantation and we have with us a very well known doctor Padma Shri Dr. Jos Chako Periyapuram. Let us welcome him to the program. Welcome doctor. First of all we'd like to know your experience in the field of heart transplantation. Heart transplantation as you know is not a commonly done procedure in our part of the world. Uh, there are multiple reasons for that. but initiating a program of heart transplantation is always a difficult uh, proposition because it in- involves lots of uh, organizational um, administration wise as well as a great teamwork so it was uh, quite difficult for me to uh, to kind of instill an idea of heart transplantation to the hospital where i was working and to the team members also uh, fortunately Uh, we could uh, organize a heart transplantation program in a in small state of kerala in 2002 okay. by convincing the hospital administration as well as my co doctors that this is going to help lives and definitely the patients who need a heart transplantation are are people at the end stage of their heart disease and heart failure and if we don't do transplantation on them they are going to die within few months or a few weeks or in a short period of time and that um idea of saving somebody's life by doing a heart transplantation that was instilled into the team members and we could get a team organized so that is how we could uh, materialize the first heart transplantation in kerala in 2003 okay doctor could you explain us the importance of organ donation see organ donation if uh, on a broader perspective there are two types of organ donations one is an organ donation when you are alive for example we have got paired organs like we have got two kidneys so we can give a kidney to a, a person who deserves it so that is called live donor it can be a live or related donor when a mother gives the kidney to the son or the wife gives the kidney to the husband so that is possible only when you have got more than one of similar organ and you need only one organ to no- lead a normal life it can be a live related donor or it can be a live unrelated donor okay. who is matching with the blood group and various other um, antibody antigen typing the other type of organ donation is donation of organs after your death so when i say after death there are two types of death one is a clinical death that is when we normally say that you know somebody has died so the person is completely dead all his organs and parameters of come to a succession that is called clinical death but lot of times we find accidents whereby the victim get involved with a head injury all the organs are functioning except the brain okay. so that is called brain death and brain death or irreversible brain death see brain is a very important part of our uh, human body yeah. and the uh, most important job the brain is doing in our body is controlling the breathing so without breathing we cannot survive so there are certain centers in the brain which controls breathing and when that center get damaged permanently the patient will stop breathing if you don't resuscitate this patient within a short period of time for example 5 minutes or 10 minutes the patient will stop his heart will stop and he will go to a clinical death so if such a patient arrives the hospital from an accident site the doctors will put the patient on a breathing machine or we call it ventilator so the function which the brain is supposed to do in the form of breathing uh, is is done by the machine so we are extending the life by giving breaths to the patient but we can do it for a day maybe at a couple of days maybe 3 days and in between that time if the brain does not recover we have to call it a day because we can't keep somebody on the ventilator life long so we do certain test to see whether this brain is going to recover and bring breathing back to this individual and if the tests are unfavorable we call that patient as a brain dead patient okay. this brain dead patients if we discontinue the ventilator within 5 minutes the oxygen supply to the organs will will stop and the heart will stop and other organs will stop functioning and that situation is what is called irreversible brain death situation supported by the machines okay. those patients who are irreversibly brain dead 
are the potential organ donors. That is called cadaveric organ donation. They can donate any organ in the body. They can donate heart, they can donate liver, they can donate lungs, they can donate kidneys, pancreas, skin, bone, whatever. You know, there are so many organs which you can donate. So, such a brain dead patient's family will be informed that, you know, your guy is brain dead and the medical field cannot do anything to keep him alive. So, if you would like to donate organs for keeping somebody else's life, you can do that. If not, we will disconnect the patient off the ventilator and hand over the body to the family for the rest of activities. So, those are the uh, type of people who can give vital organs like lungs and heart and all. So, they are called cadaveric organ donors. So, we have discussed two types. One is a live related or live unrelated donor and a cadaveric donor. So, these two types of donation has to, in India and in, in Asian countries, most of the organ donation are live related or unrelated donors. Cadaveric organ donation has not picked up in India. For example, in countries like Spain and all, out of a million death, about 35 people donate organs, while in India the figure is only 0.5, with it pathetically low. So, we have to motivate the society and the people to carry donor card and to donate organs so that we can save more and more lives who suffer from uh, end-stage organ disease. So it's very important to have the organ donation program running in the nation to uh, treat the patients in end-stage organ failure. So now could you explain us the economic aspects of organ transplantation? See, the organ transplantation uh, is definitely an, is an expensive affair. Okay. Um, it's not because of the organ uh, harvesting or organ transplantation. It is related to the medicines which we use after the particular surgery. You know, whatever we say, of course, when we take an organ from a donor, we do blood cross-matching. We can take only a heart from a donor. Suppose if I am O positive, I can receive heart from only an O positive donor. Okay. So, this matching is there. And also, we do some antibody matching as well, HLA typing, we call it HLA typing. So, in spite of all this typing and cross-matching, there is an incompatibility between people to people. Every individual in the world is different from the other individual. Not from the looks, but chromosomal, genetic, antibody, antigen wise. So, anything which comes into your body will be rejected by the human body. For example, suppose if you, if you have got a thorn in your, uh, in your skin, it will, until it, it is removed, the body will fight against it. You got an infection and, you know, you have to get it out, then only the wound will heal. Likewise, somebody's organ is coming into your body. In spite of all the possible matching methods available to us, still the recipient's body will fight against the donor organ. Okay. So, we have to give certain medicines to prevent this. What we, this, is, this is called rejection. Okay. Rejection is a possibility. So, to prevent rejection, we have to give certain medicines. They are called immunosuppressants, suppressing our immune system. You know, immune system means the fighting. Everybody has got an immune system which <clears throat> fight against the bacteria, against the virus or anything. And whenever we get an infection, the body fight against it. That is called an antibody or cellular mediated immune mechanism. And so, this heart when it comes or a kidney when it comes to your body, the immune mechanism will fight against this somebody else's organ. So, we have to give medicines and medicines are expensive. And that is where the economics play a major role. And um, depending upon which organ transplantation you are uh, doing, the immune suppressants, the dose, the patterning, the period and everything will be different. So, that can cost a lot of money. But on an average, a hospital can do a heart transplantation for a cost as low as 5 to 6 lakhs. Okay. The various hospitals may charge differently because of their um, backup facilities and, uh, you know, infrastructure and manpower. Uh, kind of things. But the actual cost of a transplant will not be more than 7.5 lakhs, um, including the surgery and the immunosuppressants and medicines for one month. Okay. So, it's not a very expensive thing. Even a bypass surgery will cost a patient a couple of lakhs. So, having a heart transplanted for 7.5 lakhs is not a big amount of money. And immunosuppressants, for example, probably in the first few months may cost around 20,000, 25,000 a month, maybe until six months. 
after that it comes down to 15,000 rupees a month and after one year it may come down to as low as 5,000 a month okay. which is an average cardiac patient takes medicines uh, they take it for about 2,500 rupees a month so it is not that expensive affair but it is it is a organization of a transplantation program which takes effort and manpower and teamwork that is the real investment in a transplantation program than money itself okay is there any religious aspect that affect all these procedures when you say religious aspects religious aspect does not affect the transplantation per se but um, definitely the religious beliefs has got a big say in organ donation certain religions believe in uh, reincarnation and um, of course the reincarnation comes in the form of a physical body in the next birth it may be either as another human being or as another creature so if somebody dies without all the organs being buried or uh, um, you know cremated or whatever it is um, certain religions believe that they don't have a second birth so in a country like india where there are so many religions so many thought processes so many beliefs convincing everybody for a an organ donation after death will be difficult but lot of religions teach people philanthropy lot of religions teach them charity selflessness helping other people so the basic concept of every religion is having sympathy to the fellow being and donating an organ is a, is a, one of the greatest expression of charity in our life and that way i think religion when it comes to the nutshell promote organ donation indirectly though some religions has got a belief that you have to be cremated or buried in entire then only you can have the rebirth in a better form so that can but again i don't think that should be kept as a reason why we don't promote organ donation but there are so many religions which even islam religion at, at some stage were not very keen on organ donation but now they have come around and the leaders always promote organ donation so i don't think the religious barrier is a major role in donating organs after death presently what are the facilities available for organ transplantation the organ transplantation um, we have got all the facilities in our part of the world um, as it is available in the west um, what you really need is a concerted effort by a group of people organ transplantation does not need extra equipmentations for an institution for example a heart transplantation um, what we need are like heart lung machine and certain uh, devices which we really need for a regular bypass operation or a valve operation that's all what we need for a heart transplantation as well but the organizational things like uh, motivating people for donating organs and um, i told earlier we were discussing about cadaveric organ donation yes. see when somebody is brain dead and in a hospital on a ventilator generally the medical staff probably may not put in so much effort to keep this patient's parameters stable so if the family agrees look doctor you can take the organ of my son or my husband the that donor should be the potential donor should be optimized okay he should have normal blood pressure he should have normal kidney function he should have normal electrolytes so all the parameters should be normal then only we can take this organ though this individual is brain dead his organ should be well preserved that we call it donor preparation okay. so the donor preparation needs lot of effort giving fluids glucose optimizing sugar optimizing electrolytes hormonal supplements there there is an important role for the doctors to optimize them second thing is organ transportation then third thing is organ transplantation so it is infrastructure what we need a development it is not the equipment when i say infrastructure the organizational infrastructure and great coordination between the team on the donor side as well as on the recipient side because when you take an organ you can't keep the organ forever okay. so a different organ has got different uh, durability or kind of uh, flexibility we call it ischemic time it is something like you take an organ from a donor you have to keep it preserved and the preservation time is different for example a heart which you take from a donor you cannot keep the heart for more than 4 hours 
within four hours you have to take it transport it bring it back to the recipient stitch it and make it to start working so that is a marathon organization you need maybe kidneys little easier because you can uh, stay for 8 hours liver is little easier because you can keep it for 10 hours lungs you can keep it for 10 hours so the heart has got the lowest time frame for preservation so catching up with this time and containing the whole program within 4 hours that is what it is so you need a lot of uh, infrastructural organizational uh, enhancement to keep it going and to establish transplant program as a regular basis in all centers that is where the effort need to be put in how do we face and convince the relatives of a donor oh it is very difficult you know most of the donors are young donors um, that is sometimes when we go for organ harvesting you know sometimes we we ourselves think that we are not at all emotional because uh, you can see a lot of uh, emotionally strong activities from the dear and near one so the guy who suppose for example you you lose your son at the age of 17 or 18 years and um, it will be very difficult for the parents to be convinced that you know his son or her son is lost yeah. they will always want the children you know maybe about a month ago when we were going for an organ um, harvesting this young boy who is uh, who passed recently his exams and he took his bike and went away to a beach side to 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 take a selfie and on the way um, a dog jumped across and he had to move the bike and it banged somewhere and you know he lost his life so these kind of things how can a, a family accept you know at the prime of life the only son the father not alive so the mother how will he bear the death of the son it is very difficult so on top of convincing the mother that your son is lost if you ask for an organ that is all the more difficult for them to understand or to to comprehend when they are unable to accept the death they should be motivated to give the organs so it is very difficult there is a lot of counseling they need and the only way we can convince them is to tell them that anyway your near and dear one is gone but if we want to see him living through somebody else's life the best way is organ donation and we know that you know god doesn't need our organs up in the heaven so let let it be utilized somewhere in the earth to to save somebody's life so we have got multiple sittings with the family with the parents maybe with the social leaders who can motivate them and convince them that this is going to save lives and uh, that is you know that is 50% of times it may become fruitful and there are a lot of situations when the parents did not consent for organ donation that is where the media plays a major role that is how these programs which we are doing now plays a major role a message is given to the society that in case if we lose our life let it not happen but if it happens unfortunately let our life be cherished or in you know, a perpetuated by giving our organs to somebody who deserve it that message has to go to the society then only in such a situation the family may agree for an organ donation it is painful it is of course painful but it is something which is achievable and which has to be thrusted to the mind of people okay mm-hmm. how do you see both death and birth as two sides of a same coin usually we don't think about it you know i mean sometimes we think after a while the doctors become ruthless people because we cut through tissues we do operations and the emotions of course plays a role but it goes to the to the back of your mind so the death is something which is not uncommon in our lives we see it every now and then in our career and we live with the people who suffer so suffering is not new to us so this is something which make up the mind of a doctor or the period of many years when you do mbbs when you see a cadaver for a learning purpose you know you feel bad about it when you see blood for the first time you worry about it when you see death for the first time you know you can't digest it down but over a period of years you know you live with all these problems in your life so when somebody dies if somebody can be brought alive from his life though it is you know to entirely different scenario where you go to a place where the family is kind of uh, crying or mourning the death of an individual you see that without thinking too much about it you take the organ 
bring it and on the other side there is a family waiting for a new life so of course it is very different sides of the same coin but we always look for hope the hope is what keeps people alive and people living so we are always hopeful about a better side of the coin and we generally tend to forget on the bad side of the coin that's only way we can get our uh, mission accomplished what makes you close to heart well i don't know whether i am close to heart or not i am close to heart physically because i touch people's heart every day but when we say about heart you know the heart may be a symbol of our emotions our thought processes our wishes our ambitions everything we attribute to the heart but from a cardiac surgeon's point of view we don't think the heart as a an emotional thing we think it as a an organ another organ in the human body which keeps a person going of course every doctor or every good individual has to be close to the heart of another individual which shows a sympathy to that person which shows a love to that person concern about the person's uh, difficulties so i am as close to a person's heart as you are close to another person's heart physically we touch we treat we operate on the heart doesn't mean that we are close to the heart but every doctor has to be close to the heart of the patients and the family whom they treat okay how do you differentiate between male and female hearts right this question has asked to me many a times by many different people but generally we know the uh, for all practical purposes the women are stronger than men they are more resilient they can withstand stress much stronger than men in long term when a wife uh, is lost to a husband the husband probably may not be seen crying but when a husband is lost you can see the wife crying beyond comprehension but they can pick up immediately in a short period of time and they can their life can uh, the, the loss of the husband can be substituted by the wife much easier than uh, a man can substitute a woman's loss so physically for all practical purposes female heart is much stronger than male heart but when you look at the heart as an organ when we operate we find the female hearts are smaller and uh, they are more difficult to be operated on because they have got smaller blood vessels and their tissues are little bit more softer and gentler than the uh, male heart but generally the female patients tolerate surgery as well much better than the male hearts so i think there is a physical as well as structural as well as um, emotional strength is more with the female compared to the male uh, hearts what are the challenges that you face as a surgeon the challenge being a surgeon depends on you know where you work and in which situation you are in see uh, i was basically trained abroad i was in uk for 10 years okay. and um, when i came back to india to start my cardiac surgical career it was a great challenge for me that was a time when in a small state like kerala there was no open heart surgeries happening coronary bypass was not there i'm talking about 1995 96 period of time and um, people from kerala state used to go outside to other states or other nations to have the surgery done so doing a bypass or a heart surgery in kerala was really uh, not something which people could digest it down they thought that it is something which we can't do it here so it was against all the odds that i had to set up a cardiac surgical or a coronary bypass program in in kerala um basically the organization of the department it is not like general surgery where you can go and do appendix or hernia or something like that you need a huge team because when you do a heart operation you need to have a heart lung machine your heart is stopped when you stop the heart and when you stop the lung the function of the, the those two organs has to be taken up by another equipment called heart lung machine the blood moves through that and there is a pump in that there is an oxygenator in that which is which are the substitution for the actual heart and the lungs 
there are people the team the the perfusion so called perfusion has to be there to operate that machine during heart surgery anesthesia has a very important role in cardiothoracic surgery okay. because of the variations in the blood pressure and various other metabolic parameters so getting a team together also post operative recovery there nurses physiotherapist and various other people who are it's a concentrated team effort so the organization of a cardiothoracic unit was a major challenge for me convincing the people that you need heart surgery that was a difficult at that time those time there was only one cardiothoracic center where i was working in the state of kerala now down the line 15 years we have got 45 centers in kerala doing open heart surgeries so this there is a slow process of evolution mm-hmm. so when i started i had great difficulty in organizing a team i had great difficulty in persuading the patient and the family to undergo a heart surgery all the more difficulty to persuade them to have a heart surgery done in kerala and then post operative progress their rehabilitation everything is a huge challenge but again everything in our life is challenge you know if you i used to remember the director of my hospital at that time he had a small board on his wall it is written there what stops you from going forward is not what is in front of you it is what is inside you so if you want to do something you just go forward do not worry about the obstacles if you have a will there is a way so that is how we persuaded and now after so many years we have brought this state to a situation where you know it's in par with any other western countries not only with the care the results and the post operative rehabilitation and reintegration to the society of patients they are all as in par with the western western countries so all the challenges could be overcome with teamwork and persuasion can you share with us some unforgettable experience in your career my every experience in my career are, are unforgettable but certain things as you said will strike your mind and probably may remain in your mind for the rest of your life and um, i'm not sure whether you are aware that i have i was involved with the first heart transplantation in the state of kerala that was in 2003 when we were talking about the team work of establishing a transplantation program and motivating the patient to donate organs it is equally challenging to motivate a patient to go for a heart transplantation also okay so if i say that look you have a bad heart and your heart is going to stop maybe in the next few months time the patient will say doctor what should i do then if i say that you need a heart a new heart and a heart transplantation to be done it is going to be very difficult for that person to digest it down so living with somebody's organ in our body is something which is has got a big psychological impact so this is going back to 19 uh, going back to 2001 when we were preparing for the heart transplantation program we went for a medical camp okay. uh, to a place called uh, haripad and uh, we were examining patients and uh, suddenly my cardiologist came up to my room and said that dr jos i have got a patient downstairs who has got a dilated cardiomyopathy it is called dcm or dilated cardiomyopathy the heart is expanding beyond the limit okay. see heart is like an elastic it can accommodate it can stretch and accommodate certain amount of blood and then as the elastic is uh, recoiling the heart pumps it is doing like oh, this okay. every beat but when the elastic has lost its elasticity it becomes unduly long it is easily stretchable and it doesn't recoil so that condition happens to the heart as well that is called cardiomyopathy and these are the kind of patients who probably will need a heart transplantation so this guy has come downstairs and would you mind seeing him then i i said fine absolutely and he came up to my room and that is mr abraham very bold strong guy and i said i am dr jos and uh, uh, my cardiologist has examined you and you have got a heart which is not very good abraham or oh, doctor i know it i knew it i went to many hospitals and they told me that i probably may die within the next 6 months i am prepared for it the nice said abraham you don't have to be prepared for death can you get prepared for a heart transplantation then he looked at me and he said yes if it can be done so it it kind of is a pleasant surprise for me yeah. a patient is motivating the doctor to have it done 
And I said, Abraham, I've never done one transplantation before. And he looked at me and he said, Doctor, you can do it. I'm willing to have it done. So that confidence which he gave it to me in my mind is that what really motivated me to start the program. And Abraham was the first candidate who underwent the heart transplantation in Caroline 2003. It is his trust and his uh, motivation and his uh, strong belief that he is going to have a successful transplantation. That is what helped us in establishing a program uh, of heart transplantation. That is in my memory. I always remember Abraham for his confidence, his trust, and maybe he is one of the secrets in motivating myself and my team for establishing heart transplantation in Kerala. And uh, that is one of the most memorable things and stepping stone in my uh, progress of my career as well. So Abraham is always in my mind. Okay. Doctor, we have heard of Heart Care Foundation. Could you just tell us more about it? We have, uh, as I said earlier, I have done the first heart transplantation in Kerala. And that was a big news in the media. And a lot of hospitals were so happy that the transplant program has taken up in Kerala as well. Like in 1997, when I came, motivating a patient for a bypass was difficult. Even for an angioplasty was difficult. But in about six, seven years' time, we could reach a stage that we could even transplant the heart. So this credit which I got and the recognition which I got from the society, I thought should reinvest it back to the society. So in, in the Bible itself, there are a lot of parables saying that the people have been given certain abilities in their life. And if you are given an ability, you are responsible for that and you have to utilize it for yourself and for the rest of the society. That conviction which made me to do something for the society. Okay. So we registered a society called Heart Care Foundation in 2006 and uh, the main, pro main project which we had at that time was to do a research among the public to look at the prevalence of heart disease in, in our state and uh, later extend to the national level and to motivate the people to, to lead a lifestyle to prevent, with a preventive type of a approach. But the Heart Foundation did not have that kind of manpower to do that. So we thought that we have to penetrate to the society. The Heart Care Foundation should be known to the society. And the easiest way to, known, to be known to the society is to get involved with the charitable activities. So in 2007, we launched a program called Thousand Hearts, Thousand Lives, Thousand Families. And that project was aimed at helping 1,000 patients to have their heart surgeries done in various government medical colleges in Kerala. 100 per year, 10 years. Now we are on the ninth year, now this year, and we have completed 910 heart surgeries. So we are right in line. Uh, we have almost helped patients to a tune of about 2 crores uh, rupees to have their heart surgeries done in the last 9 years. On top of it, we have got a lot of educational programs as well. And one of such program is called Save a Life, Save a Lifetime. And um, this is a program where we educate the common public about basic life support. Probably you would read in the newspaper every day that somebody has suddenly collapsed and fell down and, and died. Somebody is, speak, is speaking on the stage, suddenly falling down and dying somebody waiting for the bus, somebody waiting for the train, suddenly collapsing and dying. It's a common thing which is happening in our society or any other societies in the world. But suppose if somebody collapses in front of us, can we do something? A lot of times you read in newspapers, by the time the victim was brought to the hospital, he was dead. The main treatment which we can deliver to this guy is to keep him alive till the hospital or till an ambulance care come to the patient. Then only the hospital can perpetuate the life. There is no meaning in bringing a dead body to the hospital. So how can we keep this person alive when somebody collapses, his heart stops, his breathing stops? We have to revive this guy, keep him alive till a proper medical care arrives the patient. That is called basic life support. So we train people for basic life support. It's otherwise called CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Cardio means heart, pulmonary means lung, resuscitation means revival. So every individual in our society should know how to do a basic life support, how to maintain the heart, 
how to press on the chest to keep the heart pumping how to give an artificial breath to keep the oxygen going and how to maintain the airway so that by the time a proper medical help comes this person will be in a situation where he can be salvaged so that is a program called save a life save a lifetime and we educate we go to small groups teach them how to do a cpr and give them free leaflets booklets and keep on doing the programs in small centers like residential associations or small associations and that is one of the major project which we are okay. and we have got actually albums songs sung by leading uh, playback singers and groups to educate people about organ donation and the basic life support likewise we have got lot of programs the heart care foundation is uh, doing and we are actually planning for a concept called heart village okay. where eventually we will have a land with people where they can come meet each other share their grievances and uh, read library rehabilitation centers which will help the patient to be reintegrated back to the society after a bypass surgery or a heart attack so these are all ultimate aims of heart care foundation okay can you brief us on the importance of cpr cpr is a process by which you keep an individual alive generally cpr is done in a situation where a person develop a cardiac arrest we have to differentiate between a heart attack and a cardiac arrest heart attack means that a person develop a chest pain and sweating but he is quite conscious and uh, he can do his normal activities you probably would have heard that certain people in spite of chest pain has driven themselves to the hospital casualty and got the treatment so that heart attack is something different cardiac arrest is something different cardiac arrest means the heart completely stopping okay when you have got a cardiac arrest the heart stops beating your blood does not move suddenly you will collapse and become unconscious and uh, those are the people who probably would benefit from cpr okay. so we have to make the heart functioning the heart is stopped so there are two three steps uh, which we will instruct people to carry out to keep this guy alive so in a unexpected place for example in a in the middle of a crowd or at a work site or while waiting for a bus or train in a bus or railway station suddenly somebody happens to collapse and generally people are little afraid to go close to that individual because they don't know what has to be done so if you know that yes i know that i have to do certain things and i know that what i am going to do this on this guy probably may save his life so it is important that everybody should know what exactly has to be done in case if somebody falls down collapsing because of a cardiac arrest so the studies have shown that if effective cpr or cardiopulmonary resuscitation is established in the right time at least 30% of people who otherwise would have died from a cardiac arrest could could be saved okay. which is a huge number and if you can save one life out of two or three whom you try it is worth it that's why we call it save a life save a lifetime you give somebody's life back is getting a lifetime not only for him for his family for his kids or for his wife so it is very important the the value of life has to be thrusted to the mind of people so cpr can save lives only thing is that we should know when to do cpr okay. and we should know how to do cpr so that is the training which the people need to be given okay. why cpr awareness is not getting prominence it is getting prominence but it is not being given the right depth of importance by the systems which we have if if you ask a person on the road do you know anything about cpr i am sure 99% of people would say no i don't know what is cpr what is cpr they will ask you but if you go to the west on the road side you ask somebody what is cpr or basic life support they would know because it is through the media through the news and through smaller groups of people the cpr importance has been thrusted to the people so the importance has to be generated by the governmental body through educational media even at school time the students should be educated about how to do cpr and what is cpr and what is importance of cpr okay. and also it should be born into the mind of the people about the value of life see in our type of society i would call our society self centered nobody wants to get involved with other people's problems 
not that we need to get involved with their problems but when they really need your help still people are keeping away that selfishness has come into our minds so the love for the fellow being the responsibility of you as a good samaritan in your life this kind of things has to be thrusted in the mind of the children when they are growing up then they will understand the value of cpr when you lose the dearest and the nearest one to you you always mourn about it but when somebody's dearest or nearest one dies probably we may not care about it that is what is we, i call it as a self centered society or self centered family so we have to break open that system and to give value for every individual and that will probably bring a message self message to the people it should come from our mind that i owe this much to that man or i owe this much to the society that feeling of belongingness and responsibility to the society has to be inculcated in the mind of the students at a at a childhood period itself then educate them about cpr it will spread into the society as a uh, in a, in a, in, a, in a wider form in a serious form train them go to groups that is what heart care foundation is trying to do we go to smaller groups we have mannequins we train them how to do an airway management we train them how to do breathing compressions we take baby mannequins and and teach the mothers how to get a foreign body out from the throat of a child so we we read in the newspaper that you know child is died because a coin got stuck in the throat or a peanut got stuck in the nose so how is with some easy simple maneuvers we can get it out and save the life generally mothers panic and they are unable to do the right thing in the right way so these are educational programs which we have to do at home level at residential association level societies level school levels and then only the the, the message of uh, cpr will go to the society and they should know how to do it then only they will be confident to tackle such a situation when there is a need for that lastly what your heart have to say to our viewers see i feel that uh, the heart disease if if we're talking as a physical illness it is largely preventable of course it is treatable as well so it is always better that the society lives a healthy life by abstaining from the risk factors which can produce heart disease for example a healthy living the we know the risk factors to develop heart disease like smoking overeating like overweight like hypertension lot of things except for the family history every reason which produce heart disease are preventable okay so the society should know which are the reasons why an individual can get a heart disease with so they should live a a life or they should modify their lifestyle in such a way that they should be should, should not be the victims of heart disease in the wrong time the problem with our society is that we develop heart disease in our part of the society at least 10 to 15 years earlier than the west gets heart disease so our society the younger people get involved with heart disease and you can imagine a young guy at the age of 40 years just suddenly die of a heart attack leaving behind a young widow couple of small children the family is unable to proceed family become unstable it become a social burden society get stressed so this could be all avoided by a healthy living so my message to the people of our state is to lead a healthy life stop smoking if you are a smoker do regular exercises if you are not doing it eat a uh, eat for your life not eat for too much of pleasure check your cholesterol and uh, lead a healthy lifestyle to prevent or to reduce the risk of heart disease and that would take us a long way in prevention of heart disease as well as detection of heart disease and probably to reduce the intensity of the heart attack if it happens in our society okay. doctor that was nice talking to you thanks a lot for being a part of our program thank you so that was dr jos tiakoperipuram with us until we meet next time this is me nana signing off take care <laughs>